Well, I guess what we'll do is we'll just get started with introductions. You guys just kind of introduce yourselves. Yeah. All right. So I am Josh Pasquito. I am the uh, showrunner for Gunner Heat PC. It was originally a personal project that I started, and then it turned into uh, something bigger. And I've been very fortunate to work with a small team of uh, passionate game developers now for a couple of years, and we're really taking things to the next level. I am Blake Faruja. I am one of said passionate game developers that <laughs> he was just talking about. Uh, my background is mostly in computer science. Uh, I've been a, a developer for back-end front-end systems for probably the last 10, 11 years now. But uh, I've always had a passion for video game development. And as this project has taken off, and I've been able to help my good friend Josh, I've been able to learn a lot about Unity, and I've been uh, doing that for about two or three years now, going full-time earlier this year to help with the project. Uh, so, Josh, you said it started kind of as a, a passion project of yours. I mean, how, how long ago did you really start putting this to, you know, into effort into it? So, I've been uh, working as a professional Unity developer for over 10 years now. And uh, in 2017, I was a military simulation developer. And uh, I kind of started this as a side project because I saw there weren't any tank games that hit exactly what I wanted out of a tank game. And mm -hmm. I realized, hey, I might as well just make my own. I have the, the skill set in the background. Uh, so yeah. I went and started in 2017. That was, uh, for a few years, it was just me working on it publishing mm -hmm. updates in uh, zip files for uh, Discord servers or whatever. And eventually it grew enough. I thought, hey, there might be something here. Made a Patreon page. And then in 2020, I started accepting help from people from the community who had stepped up and said, hey, I have this skill. I can probably help you out with models. I can help you out with code. I can do this and that. And uh, it's okay. kind of snowballed from there to the point where I was able to quit my job, go full time, and uh, now we're a legitimate outfit. We've got a game on Steam as a demo right now and planned for mm. early access this year. Yeah, he picked a really small scope of a game to, to try for his first one, uh, honestly. <laughs> Something super doable, very easy. Right, nothing complicated. Everyone's no. done this before. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's actually yeah. Been, it's been incredibly difficult at times, but also uh, mm. rewarding when we overcome certain challenges yeah absolutely yeah. yeah that's a huge leap of faith to uh to just make this your full-time gig i mean you must have felt pretty pretty strongly about the success or you know at least the direction it was going yeah it was a little dicey uh it happened i think during the initial phase of the covid lockdowns not long after mm -hmm. that started uh mm -hmm. i hadn't planned on jumping to it so early i knew i was eventually going to go full-time on it. It, it if it continued growing the way it was it was kind of inevitable but uh mm. i ended up with the whole work from home situation during covid i burned out very rapidly from my previous job and at that point it was like the only sensible course of action just go full-time on my own project and recover that yeah well, there's, and there's something to be said too about, you know, making money, but also doing something you love and, and, you know, those things can kind of balance each other out. It's like, you know, I'm making maybe less money, but I'm doing something I love or, or whatever. Yeah, so, for sure. Um, there's uh, yeah, you can't awesome. really put a price tag on it as long as you can yeah. pay your bills and such. I was fortunate to have enough savings from the software job before that I was, uh, I was able to ride that out until I recovered. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, so, I mean, you kind of touched on there weren't other games that were kind of scratching the itch. I mean, what, what is the, uh, you know, what is the genesis of all this for, for you guys? Like what, what games back in the day inspired you to, to try to create this? So for me, it was uh, actually a pretty short list. I used to play mm -hmm. various sim light or uh, military themed vehicle combat games. Uh, the Novologic mm -hmm. series was very cool. Uh, played Comanche, played Armored Fist, and uh, I think all the hours that I spent on Armored Fist 3 in particular really shaped my assessment of what a tank game could be. And when I was looking for tank games in kind of the current day, I didn't see any that were in that mold. I see a lot of um, free-to-play kind of uh, 
MMO grind type things. I see a lot of arena deathmatch style. I don't see a lot of sim light or a lot of uh, realism and authenticity stuff. Those are actually kind of the ones that I was playing, uh, not early back in the day, but uh, I, I mean, I started with like World of Tanks, War Thunder, those kinds of things. And uh, I had a, a general understanding of them. But the ones that uh, really inspired Josh, he introduced them to me. I didn't put an insane amount of time into them, but uh, I I see where a lot of his vision came from in that regard. So when he was showing me, like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if we were able to do something like this from these older games? Like, and his passion kind of came through in that regard, and that kind of made me want to work on the project more. Right. What, uh, I, I mean, your game kind of reminds me of um, the old Microprose M1 Tank Platoon, too. Have you guys <laughs> yeah, everybody looked into that, that game at all? <laughs> I never had the opportunity to play that one. I was uh, very limited in what I was able to try out as a kid. It was just kind of whatever I happened to pick up from the rack at Best Buy. So yeah. I never stumbled <laughs> across M1 Tank Platoon 2. I'm sure I would have loved it. I've looked into it a little bit since, and uh, it looks right up my alley. Just it didn't happen back yeah. then. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, we're probably jumping ahead. I mean, go ahead describe. I mean, what is Gunner Heat PC like in a nutshell? What is what is the goal? What is the vision? And where are we at right now with it? So, Gunner Heat PC, in a nutshell, is a love letter to tanks, to mounted combat. It is a uh, it is a game that attempts to encapsulate not just the tanks themselves, but why they are the way they are, what environment they were intended to fight in. And just kind of the whole picture. Uh, it's when, when tanks are depicted in isolation in games, it kind of cheats them out of their nuance because they were never designed in a vacuum. They had a specific purpose and a specific context. There were certain threats that they were designed to defend against or overcome. Uh, and we wanted to kind of uh, model all of that at the same time. So we we have a game that's featuring these armored vehicles, but with a much broader scenario going on, uh, infantry, artillery, all that stuff. Uh, that's all coming you know, before the game's finished. And we've got these theaters of war where all the tanks and other vehicles that are in the theater are part of the same theme. They were all coexisting. They're all from a time and a place and they make sense together. And that kind of whole picture view of tanks is what we're trying to go for. And then the other big point, not just the simulation, not just the uh, authenticity, but we want it to be fun. So simple controls, as much commonality as we can find in the uh, the control schemes and how you play. Easy to pick up, uh, hard to put down. Yeah, I think that's, I, I think you've definitely hit the nail on the head with that one because the first time I played it, it was like, oh, okay. You know, I mean, and, and tanks aren't inherently difficult in the sense that there's not a lot of buttons and knobs and switches, um, but still, it is very easy and very approachable for someone brand new just jumping into it. You know, there's just a couple buttons and, and you're pretty much set to go. Um, yeah, for sure. So, I mean, it's not necessarily a study level type game where you've got to have all this intimate knowledge and read a lot of books, but it's not an arcadey just jump in and, you know, first person shooter, but you look like a tank. You know, it's right. kind of that middle ground. Yeah, yeah. I've said at times that it felt like sometimes tanks and games are they're an aesthetic or a skin over yeah. a first person shooter and that is yeah. certainly you know you get elements of that because it's a game and you have a first person perspective but yeah. we wanted to add a little bit of the extra detail the fire control systems all that stuff yeah. to really make it feel like the tank is what matters what's yeah, been really cool is having other people who like actual tank crew members who have come into our discord server and say wow you guys have really captured what this was i used to be a tanker back in pick year uh for for <laughs> whatever they did for like oh I, I used to be in the gulf war desert storm or, or something and they'd say like this is exactly how it played this or played this is exactly how it was used <laughs> yeah. and uh you guys really kind of captured that uh and then they say some kind of like one-off comment of uh, oh, how do I do this now? How do, what what are these controls? Swinging us back around to oh right, we're still work in progress, and we still need to put all the bells and whistles on everything. But it's it's been very cool getting that like uh, 
uh, opening up to people uh, the yeah. accessibility aspect of things. Yeah. No, I mean, I was struck right away with the 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 sound. You know, the audio. It just took me back because you know I I hadn't been on a tank. I think the last time I was I was on one was like 2012, but that was just for a day. But you know, I hadn't been on tanks crewing them till back in like 1999, 2000 time frame. But mm -hmm. just the sound and the, uh, in fact, I was commenting on stream the other day playing it and uh, just that whining sound of the turret moving was so like, yes, you know, that's what the M1 sound like, just, yeah, rrr, yeah. you know, just mm -hmm. yanking the, the turret around. You're going to really enjoy the uh, Abrams sound overhaul when it's ready. The, those Definitely. sounds that you heard are very mm -hmm. work in progress and complete. Like you might have noticed there's no hydraulic whining going right. on constantly. Yeah. All that stuff. The reload doesn't quite sound right. But we're, yeah. it's like everything else. We're fairly well studied on how this stuff is supposed to be. And we yeah. see the flaws. We see them very clearly, annoyingly clearly. <laughs> and there's never enough time to fix them all at once, but we, we get to it when we can, and it's going to be very cool. Well, if there's one thing I've learned about content creation the past two years, if, if you don't see the flaws, someone else will, and they will be sure to let you know what they are. So, oh, yes, they will. Um, oh, yeah. But uh, <laughs> And you can never get all this stuff 100% right, but I mean, I remember looking at this game. Some of my guys uh, in my Discord mentioned this maybe a year ago, and um, and we looked at it. And I remember looking, I was like, wow, you know, this is, this is pretty unpolished. And, and I, so it was always in the back of my head and I didn't think too much of it. You know, I was like, oh, you know, they're still working on it. I'm not, you know, crapping on it. It's just, it's I got a ways to go. And then when I finally looked at it again, this past week or two, I was like, holy cow, like the, the distance that you've traveled from that first look that I saw, you know, a year ago to now was amazing. Uh, it's a completely different game from, from what I remember. Um, so yeah. you're definitely, you're definitely heading in the right direction. And, um, so when you talk about the the theaters and the and the vehicles, I, there's a lot of questions that I get from people who are curious. Um, is it primarily going to be focused on full to gap Cold War, or is it going to expand? What's the plans on that? It's definitely going to expand. We haven't publicly released our list of upcoming theaters. We have a mm -hmm. pretty solid list of the several next choices, and then some more after that that we're still debating internally. Uh, yeah. it, there's so much that we can cover with this. Uh, sure. Tanks are ubiquitous ever since you know World War II, pre World War II. The, uh, we're not going to go that far back, I don't think. But modern stuff, Cold War stuff. There's so much to do there. So many places uh, we could go backward or forward in the timelines. We could expand the current theater to you know the late 80s or not the early 90s if we wanted to. We could go to North uh, Germany. We could do uh, so many different things, and yeah. uh, it's. It's so broad. The future is very exciting, assuming this takes off. We're we're also allowed a little bit of leeway in how we represent those theaters. Like with Fulda Gap, it, the obvious thing is it's the Cold War gone hot. That didn't happen. Otherwise, we would probably be living in a, a much different future at the moment. Yeah. Uh, and so we can look at a lot of actual wars, active conflicts that happened, and then look at potential conflicts that happened and say, okay, what if this sort of happened? Let's try this out. Could this become uh, uh, an interesting theater between two or more factions? Yeah. So we're, so we're always weighing kind of in that debate that uh, Josh mentioned, what would be interesting to research work on next? The um, thing that works so well about the fold the gap too is not only is it obviously such a big focal point in history, it looms large in all of the military lore. And in yeah. a way, uh, a lot of the stuff that followed it was just, you could trace it back to the buildup for the war that never happened. It all spiraled yeah. into the, the next decades. But it had every major combat platform that got expanded and developed in the next years after that. Abrams, T-72, T-80, everything. It all has this genesis there. And it's a very obvious starting point for getting as many vehicles, uh, as many varieties of vehicles done at once as we can. Once we've got that nailed, and once we have the the German countryside uh, figured out with the long sight lines and dense forests and all this stuff that's super challenging to make from a development perspective, we get folded down and we can do anything. It's pretty yeah. much coasting from there. Oh, yeah. yeah. We definitely picked hard mode as far as environment, too. We joke regularly like, man, if we would have picked a desert theme, it's just that would have been done at that point. Oh, yeah. 
But it would have been so simple. Like, uh, yeah, it wouldn't have the appeal. I think, like, uh, certainly to me, it wouldn't have had the same appeal. Um, but I, so I, I agree with your decision. I think that's the right choice because, to me, like, there's sort of two golden ages of tanks, and that's World War II, and then there's Fold the Gap. You know, and and thank God we never really had to play that one out. But you're right, like. Mm-hmm. All the things that kind of followed behind that, you know, were sort of genesis of Fold the Gap, and all the things that followed World War II, you know, had to do anything with tanks was was a genesis of that. And you know, and the kind of the cool thing is, if you did decide to go back to World War II, well, you've kind of already got the map. You know, you just kind of make some adjustments to things <laughs> true. And, and adjust it. But um, but yeah, it's better to get the hard mode out of the way. I, I think so. And then and then, like you said, it's very easy to go desert because obviously that's the next big one. Is like, oh, okay, cool, I want to do Battle of Seventy Three Eastings. Um, right. Right. But a desert map, you know, it's like, all right, cool, you know, whatever. Um, but no, I think that's cool. So uh, with full the gap, you, you kind of touched on it. I mean, there's there's a ton of type of vehicles, you know, how how much I know you, you haven't really published your list, you said, um, and I don't want you to have to try to rattle them all off. But like, what else are you looking to add into this? And is everything going to be playable? Or is it going to be like, you know, certain vehicles are playable, but certain vehicles are just kind of there? You know, what, how, what's the interaction there? Yeah, so this is a pretty uh, easy one to answer, actually. We've been pretty candid about it to a to a certain extent. Uh, when people ask, we're adding four factions in total for the Fold of Theater. Two of them we have already mostly done, which is the U.S. Army and the East German uh, National People's Army. The, we just started with those uh, kind of arbitrarily. We liked, uh, hey, T-72, T-55, let's just get the, the classics out of the way. Uh, but now we have two other ones, which is the Soviet group of special uh, group of Soviet forces in Germany, GSFG, which is going to be all the the modern Russian stuff from that era, and then we've got the West German armed forces as well, uh, okay. leopards and such. So there's a lot of exciting stuff once all of those four are in, and it really changes the balance as well. You might notice that if you play the demo, it's really a stop fest. It's uh, yeah. it's just Abrams killing everything. That's yeah. going to change a little, not just when the Russians come into the picture with slightly stronger equipment, but also when air support and artillery and infantry are in the picture, because we can really yeah. start to show how the tank wasn't necessarily the king of every battlefield, and there were still certain predators up the chain that it had to watch for. Sure. Yeah, um, and I'm glad you touched on that, because you know to, to put this into contrast to the real world, I mean... Anyone who watches this things going on in Ukraine can see that when you apply tanks to a situation and there's no supporting infantry and stuff, it, it doesn't go well for the tanks. Um, Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So with that, I know that, like you said, there's discussion of having all these other things. What can you expect when, when infantry is in? How is that going to operate uh, in the game? So there's going to be a couple of different ways infantry will show up uh one will be they'll just be in a battle it's part of the mission they're already deployed they're already holding a position defensively or whatever the case the other one will be uh mechanized infantry that's a big component of modern warfare uh, the bmp and stuff like that only exists for that purpose so it makes sense to give it that job to do uh, if you have an assault mission Your task might be, if you're the tank, make sure these infantry get to where they need to go, successfully unload and successfully hold a position. And you can kill as many enemy tanks as you want. You're not going to win the mission until the boots are on the ground. So it's going to really change the game flow for those scenarios. And as well, it will provide more targets and more threats because infantry, they don't go anywhere in the Cold War without light anti-tank and uh, even heavy anti-tank sometimes. We got RPGs, we got laws, we got dragon, we got all this stuff. It's all going to make an appearance. Well, so you mentioned artillery and air support. How is that going to be functional? So these things are not going to be player controlled directly. You're not going to be flying a plane or a helicopter or anything like that. You're not yeah. going to be driving a paladin around. What will happen is either through uh, mission parameters or with some kind of uh, support request mechanic, depending on the scenario you'll be able to see these things come into the map and uh, support either side. So you'll have planes coming in for cast runs or uh, artillery coming in from who knows where. A big point of that being either side, just because you might not have artillery or something yet, uh, Intel might report that artillery could be available for the opposite side. You'll have to be uh, judicious about your approach in that regard. Yeah. 
I, I love that. I, that's the answer I wanted to hear from you guys, uh, because that reminds me again, going back to Micropro's M1 Tank Platoon 2, where y- you had those assets, but you didn't control them, you know, directly. You just you called in artillery, you called in an airstrike, and the, the things came in and they did their own work, and you could see them out there doing stuff. And and I think that's I think that's a really good way of doing that. Um, yeah, but it's a, should definitely be a part of the game. So I'm I'm glad that you guys are adding that in. It's, it was the same kind of in like, Armor Fist as well. It was yeah. uh, you would yeah. you would hit a button and say, "I really need a, an A10 here now," and then the A10 would show up and and do some work. It's it's yeah. kind of how we also want to approach scale for all of for the entire game. Uh, there are things that are off map that want to help you, that want to hurt you as well, but they're not directly. This is a this is a front line to a much larger battle, a much larger conflict. So not everything is just focused on what you're doing right now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, that's good. Um, I was I, while you guys, I was waiting for you guys to log in. Um, I pulled up the new version that you guys had just uh, put out through Patreon, I guess yesterday, uh, and looking at the campaign generator. And so when I was going through it, it, it showed the map, and it had like three different areas, but I think you'd only pick one. But so that's kind of a an idea of what we got coming to the future is you're you're going to have different campaign areas that you work out of or how's that how's that supposed to work yeah so we haven't covered this in a ton of detail yet we're going to do a write-up soon but what i can say is that we are that that campaign mode is missing the front line which will be influenced by the battles that you do and uh, how things go Uh, plus a lot of other stuff a ton of other stuff persistent units and uh kind of vehicle inventory and uh like adjusting how much support you get based on what kind of missions you do and what kind of rewards you unlock. There's there's all sorts of things planned. Uh, that big map that you click on to pull up the smaller area with the missions, that's like the strategic map that will have the front line on it that'll show the broad context of your push that you're doing, What what's the current war all about for you, and you'll be able to see how close you are to your goal on that screen. The uh, health bars that we have at the top, that's just the temporary thing. That's a stand-in because... We want to have uh, something to work for, something uh, to serve as an end condition that's uh, not in place yet the way we want it. So, you know, we gave players something to see and something to work toward for now. So I have, a, a, I put it out to my community, um, you know, that I was going to be having this chat with you guys. And I said, hey, what, what questions do you guys have? So I've gotten quite a few um, and again, some of these are people who already follow you. They support you through Patreon and others who have never heard of the game until I guess I shared it or or some other people have shared it. Uh, So I want to go through some of these and some of these we've probably already touched on. Uh, And this one's close to my heart. Any plans for a mission editor and will there be any user mod creation capability? (laughs) Kavi, you want to take this one? Uh, No, because I want you to just just destroy their dreams. Okay, so this is... (laughs) I've got got good news and bad news. The, The good news is at... We have a list of things that we want to eventually look into. A mission editor is on that list. I don't know exactly what kind of mission editor, what detail level. Is it going to be like the DCS mission generator, or is it going to be more in-depth where you place things? I can't answer that yet. A lot of things are so far into the future, given our development priorities and the number of people we have, that it would be kind of uh, counterproductive to try to give a concrete answer at the moment. But we're thinking about it. We know that people want that. Mods, on the other hand, the outlook is a little dimmer because yeah. it, it takes quite a bit of work to set up a game so it can be modded, especially mm. cleanly, especially without breaking anything. Uh, and we have not set our game up for that purpose. We are focused purely on making the game and making it the way that we want. Uh, and to stop or slow down what we're doing in that regard to work on mod tools would be unwise at this time so anybody who's wanting to mod the game if it ever does happen you're gonna have to wait a while that's just the reality of it sure. i i okay. gave that back to josh because that's the good <laughs> cop answer mine would have been <laughs> much harsher for your audience <laughs> no that's it would have just been the no. word no uh it would have been several other things <laughs> Well, no, and that makes sense. I mean, it's a small team. You guys are, you know, you got to prioritize. And um, I mean, I would love to see a mission editor. I'm, I'm less interested in mods personally. Um, 
and but I can see eventually, yeah, I get into a mission editor, but it's it's not a priority. And and again, with having a dynamic campaign, you know, or a campaign generator type thing, um, that 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 should kind of alleviate some of that uh, need. At yeah, least for I a hope while. so. I mean, right. You're also, always going to uh, have people want it, so it's, yeah. There's also um, I think there's a bit of context missing when people ask mm-hmm. for mods because I know the average person isn't a game developer and they don't have the background of what they're asking necessarily they just see the result but yeah. the process of making things for this game is quite in depth mm-hmm. you can tell just by playing the game seeing the after action reports and, and the way the vehicles control yeah. there, it's not just a model on some kind of like common pre-made thing you, it's not yeah, just it's not a, a skin. Reskin. yeah yeah so i think people have this vision in their minds of oh, I'm going to take my favorite tank from War Thunder and I'm going to rip the model and I'm going to put it in Gunner Heat PC and it's going to be awesome. I'll make the game whatever I want because like that's what mods do. Well, who's making that? And how are you setting up the hundreds of things that you have to set up per vehicle? And how are we working that into the game to to integrate without breaking anything? There's, there's so much to it. Even right. if we wanted to do mods, it would be a massive undertaking and we at the moment don't want to do them. So that's an interesting point because I didn't think about that. I mean, how far down the rabbit hole did you guys go in understanding the internal elements of a vehicle? Because you you bring up a good point. You have these damage uh, models at the end, you know, the after action review, and you see the rounds where the round is hitting. How much of that sort of math has been done to say, okay, this type of round has done this type of penetration. This is what is inside this tank. Not just there's ammo stored here, but... How thick is the armor at this angle at this location? Like, how how detailed is that? Uh, let me give you an idea. Uh, at first, when I made this penetration system and this kind of post pen fragmentation model, I just made it shotgun from wherever the the round entered. It was very rigid, very simple. Then somebody said, "Hey, it doesn't quite work that way. Let me give you a white paper to read." And let me give you another one and another one. Oh, it's different for uh, heat rounds, accumulative. Well, let's let's have you look at these two. And I read all of it, and then I read more. And the culmination of all of that is that for every single system in the game, ballistics, armor penetration, uh, flammable modeling, oxygen, things like that in the uh, the fires, um, to some extent, the uh, optics even fire control system every single system it's bespoke it was made specifically for this game and it was made based on research that Mm -hmm. is a huge amount of work i don't even want to think about how many hours that totals and it's always in progress (laughs) because somebody can show up at any time and say hey i found you this better source Mm -hmm. and then we can look at it and say oh geez do we want to make another modification to the model to make it more realistic do we think it's good enough as it is do we want to tweak some numbers and it's constantly evolving. Yeah, the researchers who uh, have like joined us early on in the project to give us that information, it's like, oh, well, I know about this type of ammo on this kind of armor. Uh, you should read up on this. Here are some documents. Like, uh, obviously, all declassified stuff because this is from like the 70s and 80s at this point. But they all want to see the game just as much as we do perform in that kind of like realistic uh form uh, that's that's very competent in its modeling and so when they gave us this information we're basically like well okay how can we model this how can we add on to this and that's when i lock josh in his basement and he <laughs> does all of that work and in the end models come out <laughs> yeah well i think that puts a lot of context into the mods because you're right there's so much that's going on under the hood that you you got to really have a talent for it and a lot of research done. You yeah. can't just reskin, mm-hmm. you know, an M1 and now it's a T80 or whatever. Yeah. My, 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 I guess my final note on that would be it's all doable. Like the systems that we use now uh, for, uh, for the game, the game is developed in Unity. Uh, there are a lot of games out there on that platform that can do this sort of thing, but it would take us so much away from getting the game to the core values that we want to show off. And that's just sure. not a thing that we want to do right now. 
Yeah, not to mention it would cause some dilution, right? Imagine if you're looking into this brand new game, you've never heard of it before. It's from a small team, no marketing. And the first thing you see is a bunch of mods that somebody else made. How do you know what <laughs> yeah. the game is? Like you're getting a right. wrong impression right away. A, a taco yeah. truck that is a tank somehow does something <laughs> in the map. It's like, oh, this is realism. Yeah. Or you see, uh, you see a poorly yeah. modeled T90 because they didn't have access to the fire control system code the way we use it. And then it's like, oh yeah, I saw that game. It's really unrealistic. You know, we, yeah. we want to avoid all of that for sure right now. Uh, I suspect I know the answer to this question. I'm gonna ask anyway. VR. Will there be VR? <laughs> I did an experiment with VR one time. It, he did. It technically worked. I was in the game, and I was looking around from on top of a turret. There was no control, no functionality. I had my hand on the keyboard. Um, but it, for a more serious answer, as the game becomes more demanding and uh, the technical side of it expands, the room that we have there to put in VR with this extra performance demands shrinks considerably. I don't know if it would even be feasible to do VR. I can say that we don't have a plan to do it in the short term. I think this one's probably near and dear to anyone's heart. Multiplayer. What is the plan with multiplayer yes. slash multi-crew? It's been planned from the beginning. Uh, mm. We've had some challenges along the way because one of the weird things about this project, working with a small team that's kind of grown organically and has this fully crowdfunded uh, setup, we can't always afford to do things when and how we want them. By the time we were big enough to afford a developer specifically for multiplayer stuff, it was quite late in the timeline. So we're still playing catch up on that. Multiplayer will come. Multi-crew will be a component of that, optional component. Uh, it'll be mostly focused on co-op. Not sure about PvP yet, depends how it goes. But it's not ready yet, and we're not going to release kind of a half-assed multiplayer system. We want to make sure it's right. So that's going to be a little while out yet. Um, all right, let's go on through the questions. I think some of these we've sort of answered. Uh, one question is, what are the intentions of post-release content? I think you've kind of touched on that, that you're, you, you've got other theaters and then, of course, other timelines that, that you're going to explore. Yeah, exactly. Well, well, there's two forms to that for whatever post-release might be. There's post... Uh, when we actually, you know, go live on Steam, that will be for early access. And that time... I, I don't know if we have an, an exact time frame for it, but that's going to be a lot more of our polish work and in, in getting a lot of pieces put together. Uh, like a post-final release, I would definitely say more of those theaters and, and, and uh, interactions that we wanted to have. Yeah, that's a good point. So... We have this kind of two-stage release thing going on. Just like Blake said, uh, early access comes first. We have it on our Steam page as summer 2022. We have a date internally. I think we'll probably end up releasing that pretty soon here. Um, but yeah, that's going to be this year. Early access allows us to start bringing in more funding. Because while Patreon is cool, and it's awesome that people have supported us in that way, it's still a shoestring budget especially right. for a project as ambitious as this. So we feel like we're probably limiting ourselves if we don't start selling copies. Uh, and doing that will allow people to actually buy in, get what we have so far, and then help us get to the final release stage where we have a nicely polished, complete, uh, full the gap themed tank game. After that happens, then we will be free to explore new content, do theaters, uh, all that stuff. And then we will be doing kind of the old fashioned model for expansions. We're not going to be doing um, sell a single tank for $60 kind of deal. <laughs> I know that's yeah. fairly popular these days. For some reason, people do accept it. I, I really don't know why. I guess he had to be around before it happened. But wait, we're <laughs> not doing that? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunate, right? Can you imagine how much money we leave on the table? But yeah. Yeah. what we're doing instead is we're doing the traditional model. You have a game expansion. It has uh, like an entire theater, new maps, new yeah. vehicles, new factions, and it's for a reasonable price. And if you want it, you buy it. If you don't want it, you stick to the base game. It's, uh, yeah. I think it works really well. I remember when games used to work like that. It was a blast. Yeah, no, I like that. That's good. Uh, I know you... Uh, this is a tongue-in-cheek question, I hope. Uh, you, you're not making any British tanks yet. I'm sure that you eventually will. But when you do... Uh, the question is, will they also be modeled with a tea maker? 
and they uh, attached an article. Apparently, every British armored vehicle has a tea making gear. Yes, so it's called the <laughs> boiling vessel. <laughs> yeah, uh, this okay, is actually. Sure. <laughs> yes. Okay. So when I was making this game as a personal project and I was posting it on private discord servers and getting updates from these scheming, uh, assholes who played other games and wanted to troll me, uh, the first request that I got in, in this vein was the boiling vessel on British tanks. And at the time I made a solemn promise that when British vehicles arrive in gunner heat PC in whatever form, they will have the boiling vessel modeled in the damage model. And that remains wow. in effect to this day so i can i can tell you that now well there's at least one person that's gonna buy the game just based off that part of the conversation so yeah it was fascinating (laughs) i was reading this article and and like it said the study 37 percent of all armor unit casualties occurred when a crew members were outside the vehicle and guys were making tea and then it shows a, a disgusting picture of this uh this thing that you're talking about and it says it has boiled pizza it's taking a picture of this thing and they're boiling pizza i guess it's like a soup but, desperate uh, times so. that that yeah. sounds terrible yeah war is hell <laughs> but it's never been that bad for me war it, it pizza <laughs> sounds so absolutely awful um all right moving well, on we talked bef- i'm sorry before we before we jump forward a little bit actually sure. one of the things that we have worked on uh prior to that i don't know if you've seen it in your playthrough is there is a abrams with a bustle rack full of different gear and that gear is varied based on a couple of random generators that are happening Mm. but one of the abrams can have just a bustle rack full of buckets and it's that kind of variation that we've already kind of worked in so you can find Mm. If later we want to do a boiling vessel, if later we want to do any other number of weird random things that pop in. Yeah. So Well, I'll tell you what you need to put. So this was on my tank. My gunner taught me this. And after that, my tank always had one is a pallet, a wooden pallet. And the really? idea was we were we, we out in the desert. Uh, you know, you, you wanted to take a shower. You know, the, the saying is death before dismount. Armor guys don't like to get off their tank, but of course to take a shower, you kind of had to. So we would have a pallet on the, in the bustle rack. We, we toss it down. So now you didn't have to stand on the dirty ground. You could stand on the pallet and then we'd rotate the gun tube overhead huh. and we'd have our big, uh, they had, we had these issued canvas bag. It was basically a shower. It was like a shower head with a canvas bag. You boil the water, you know, heat up the water, put it in the bag, put it on the end of the gun tube, slide it over the side and you'd stand on the pallet. But yeah, just if you want to add some stuff into the bustle rack, definitely. Oh, that's a really good tip. I like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we want to have that little bit of authentic flavor. Uh, one of the things that's most right. valuable in this project is talking to people who were there, uh, people yeah. who were in the buildup in uh, Centag in the 80s, people who ran Reforger exercises and drove the original M1. Uh, this yeah. this All this knowledge that they have just kind of built up waiting for somebody to listen and someone to take it seriously and then we yeah. feel like we can do a little bit of uh, a little bit of justice to that with the details that we put in. So that's a very good, very good thing to have. Obstacles and minefields. Is there going to be anything like that? We have considered this. I think uh, one of our team members in particular, I'm sure Blake knows who I'm thinking of, really wants to put minefields in. Uh, I think it'll happen. I think there's a very good chance it'll happen soon, even. I know the team member, and I'm also one of those team members. So, oh, there you go. It <laughs> appears even if I didn't want minefields, I would be outnumbered. <laughs> yep. Right. Well, if you're going to have minefields, then I guess the question is are there going to be Micklicks, the mine clearing line charges? I know what you're talking about. And I, first of all, I don't think they had those in the 80s, did they? I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know if Windows came out. These are regularly the questions that we have. It's like, wouldn't this be cool? Huh? Yeah. Was that around then? (laughs) Yeah. No, that's a good point. Yeah, depending on the time period. I don't know when the Miklix came around. That's worth... uh, I think it'd just be cool to have. But yeah, 100%. If it's not not authentic, then definitely don't do it. But uh, uh, minefields would be cool. Obstacles would be cool. Even on my personal personal wish list that we can't add right now because it wouldn't fit the time or the place. I have just this burning desire to put in the m1a2 sep and i think it's yeah. a really cool tank I, you know they had the two axis mirror in the gps and they it didn't have the drifting reticle anymore it had the upgraded armor it's got m829a1 or a2 what have you monster of a tank we can't put it in right now 
because right. it doesn't fit the time or the place. Even the M1A1 would be a stretch, which is heartbreaking. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was my tank, and I was sad when I realized that it was just the old 105 ones, but uh, yeah. no, nah, it's still fun. It's he still regularly still calls me every month to just say, can't we just do this? It would be an easy change. I'm like, no, <laughs> stop it. <laughs> keep, keep him on task. That's good. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, I think we kind of touched on this, but I'll ask anyway. If you include additional combined arms units slash BTRs, strikers, BMDs, support anti-aircraft guns, do you intend to implement any of these uh, as controllable units? So I think fundamentally the question is, and you kind of touched on it, not necessarily everything that's going to be in game is going to be controllable. Um, yeah. But are you going to have like controllable anti-aircraft guns or is it just going to be strictly like tanks and PCs? So what we know for sure is that tanks and PCs will be player controllable, even something like a BTR. I mean, we have the BRDM in game right now. It doesn't do anything right. besides see stuff and shoot a heavy machine gun, but it's there. Yeah. Um, anti-aircraft, they seem really fun. And I personally would love to play as a Shilka in these scenarios oh, yeah. or uh, M163, uh, you know, all those cool vehicles. The problem is we have this standard that we've established, right? Where you have the fire control system and it's presented authentically. The yeah. Shilka doesn't have a gun sight where you aim at a tank and you apply a dynamic lead and you fire. Uh, mm -hmm. It has radar screens. It has this lock-on sequence it gets messages from a net that has like a special btr with antennas on it sending things out and it hooks up to the geckos and everything else so we have this extra hurdle to get it over if we want to do player spaa where we need to decide how much of that we're going to depict and how to depict it cleanly and make it still fun because uh, you may have seen there's a realistic um sam simulator out there i think yeah. it was a sam it's a maybe it was a tunguska or something one of those vehicles yeah. you, the whole gameplay is just staring at monitors inside the vehicle right and we're not sure if that would be compelling or not we have to find a way to make it that way if we want to do that yeah is, is the juice worth the squeeze because certainly there are people that right. will, will eat that up but is it enough to counteract all the work you're gonna have to do to put that in so no, yeah our whole tagline here is like we're making a great tank game that we want to play. We want it to be fun and realistic at the same time. We think we can have both. And at, wow. there's these certain rabbit holes you can go down where <laughs> maybe you have a little bit too much on the, oh my gosh, this would be so cool, and not enough yeah. on the, this would be fun. Yeah. Right. Some people actively ask for, like, is there a way to repair, like, a tank that's been, like, tracked or, or hit in the field? And we have to explain to them, like, well, as 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 much as that would continue gameplay, even easy repairs can take like in real time, 30 oh. minutes or something like uh, something oh, yeah. ridiculous. And, and we're not going to make you sit there and do that. Uh, yeah. And then we just say, I want to track smarter. You're you're done. <laughs> like you throw a track. I mean, that's it. You're out of the fight. I mean, if you yeah. can sit there and still shoot from where you are, that's great, but you, no one's getting out to, to fix the track when everything yeah. else is going on around them. That's true. Right No. No, that's one of the things that I think the game um, and if, if you're not ready for it, it will come as a shock to you, but how quick the battles are. And that's realistic because tanks are designed to, to kill other tanks, particularly, you know, mostly. And, um, those battles are fast, you know, it's like you pop up over the hill and all of a sudden, boom, you take a round and potentially it's a kill shot and you're done. You know, now, you know, of course you can jump to another tank, but, um, there's not a whole lot of time of like, well, I'm broke, but I'm going to get it fixed. I mean, these battles are happening in a matter of a couple minutes and then it's over. Or you've yeah. run out of ammo and you're trying to move ammo from the, the storage racks, which is not a good time, you know, right. working, working through that problem set. It's been kind of a challenge, actually, for us because, um, I mean, we, we understand that about the battles and we accept it. And that's purposely in the game as realistic as it was. But a lot of people are coming from other games where they have a certain expectation if something yeah. happens to me in this battle i won't die right away i'll be able to fix it and i can yeah. you know go on and level up or whatever that's yeah. it's kind of a culture shock almost when you come over to ghpc yeah. and it's more of a grounded approach to it and we get a lot of requests like can you do this like this isn't what i wanted this isn't fun and we have to kind of hold firm on these lines like this is our vision and we're making something on purpose that's not like the other games 
and we believe in it. So we're going to see it through and hopefully we'll be able to put in enough other elements that people come around to seeing it. Okay. This is actually fun in its own way and we don't have to change it to be the way it's expected. We've regularly noted that accessibility and fun are some of our core tenants, but it's in relation to what's available in the market right now. And a lot of gamers, for a lot of gamers, like even the general audience, accessibility to them means just speed. I can do this more quickly. I can I can activate certain abilities. I can get this done so I can get to the objective. When in reality, our kind of accessibility is we're giving you these extraordinarily detailed systems that you can learn and get better with, but you don't have to, like you said earlier, read a giant manual or take a course on to, to do what you need to do. Yeah. It, it, uh, yeah. I, I think I like hearing what you guys are saying because you, you have a vision and you, you're, you're trying to stick to your convictions despite all the noise that, that will try to draw you away. Um, cause you're right. Some people are, that's not going to be for them. It's not their game. Yeah. Um, they want to jump in and they want to be, they want to be the hero, you know, because that's what so many games do. You know, it's like, you can shoot this bad guy and he dies one shot, but you could take 20 rounds. doesn't make any sense. I mean, I've played your game where within 30 seconds of starting the match, I'm dead. You know, it's like from yeah. a single shot, as soon as I come over the hill, boom, <laughs> the tank, I didn't even know was there hits me. I'm like, well, okay, I guess I'm dead, you know, yep. but it's that sort of like brutality um, that that is real. You know, I mean, if you look at the Battle of 73 Eastings as a great example of a tank battle, I mean, that shit didn't last very long at all. You know, they came over the hill. Oh, there's T-72s. Boom. It was just, you know, it was game on. And a few minutes later, it was basically over. And that's realistic. So yeah. I appreciate that you guys are trying to capture that and and pay homage to that. Um, and it, and it, so far, I mean, you guys have done an excellent job, in my opinion. Well, thank, oh, you. thank you. I don't know if you've played any missions yet where you're facing uh, BMPs and they're firing Malyutka missiles at you, but just mm. like the terror that that induces into me yeah. when you're seeing those just grow slowly and slowly yeah. <laughs> uh, and then like, boom, they're right on you. Just, oh my God, it's intense. Yeah. Yeah, I made the game and I still die to uh, Saggers sometimes in the first minute of a battle. I all the okay. time. <laughs> I guess he I all got the time smarter. dies. I always well, rag him on stream when he dies. <laughs> <laughs> well, the voices too add to it. Like the first time I played it, I was like, oh, the voices are a little over the top. But then I, when I played it for a little while and you got to these intense gunfights. Um, in fact, I think I'm about to go live on a video probably tomorrow for the game. And... Um, and it was this battle where this T-72, I mean, he was close and he came out of nowhere and I'd already been in this knife fight with these other vehicles and this T-72 pops out as big as the screen, you know, and the gunner or the, the loader and everybody's screaming and stuff. Gunner, Sabo, tank! Traverse left! Heavy! On! Target! Re-engage! it was intense you know and like and mm -hmm. it's hard to convey that sometimes in a conversation or just in a video but when you're playing it and all those voices are going off yeah it, it adds to the flavor so i i and actually do appreciate the voices after the music swells it. too right yeah 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 it's, that's it's a whole thing we it's, yeah. it's something that kind of came out um we didn't plan for it from the beginning actually we kind of were inspired at one point to do dynamic music and mm. We had uh, this one person in our community who does the music for us, who's quite talented. Um, we approached him and said, hey, can you make some soundtracks that have multiple layers that we can seamlessly kind of switch up and down in intensity? And we worked wow. this out, went back and forth a bit, and it, I think it works pretty well. You get these moments where all of a sudden there's so much shit happening, and the whole yeah. entire game kind of reorients itself to say, yes, you're in an intense situation, you know, go fight. That's, it's uh, so it's funny you said cool. that because it's like I I noticed it but I didn't notice it you know what I mean like it just it was mm -hmm. subliminal to me it, it, where I almost thought it was just a, almost accidental but now that you describe that that's in, that's incredible I never even yeah, thought about keep that. an ear out for oh. it next time you play yeah. you'll notice it. Uh, the yeah. other thing about the voices too I noticed you said um, your first impression was that they were a little over the top and we hear that a lot from tankers because mm -hmm. it is true that in reality. Uh, people who have experience and you know this you're not going to be screaming because it doesn't help it doesn't change anything you just stick to the plan do your comms and then get through the fight right but it's 
kind of a flavor thing almost like we understand mm -hmm. that if your if your gunner is screaming like that you're gonna kick him you know it's not the way you're supposed to handle it but in a game uh we took a little bit of artistic license we yeah. we think it ups the intensity it really drives home what's going on and the average player is like holy shit that was intense yeah. i love it it's it's a little little tweak yeah. yeah you have to ham it up a little bit i mean it's just it's just like the top gun movies right i mean i know guys who fly <laughs> hornets and stuff and they're like you'd never do that you know but you have to do it because it's a movie and you got to spice it up but here's what right. i would say to counter that where i i kind of have backed off on the idea that it's over top it's like, yeah, you may talk to me and you may talk to other guys who are on tanks and they weren't screaming. None of us actually stared down the barrel to re real T-72 aiming at us, probably. You know, mm -hmm. maybe one or two yeah. of those guys did, but I'm willing to bet, <laughs> um, you know, and I've been in gunfights in a helicopter. Uh, yeah, your voice will go up sometimes when things are going down. So um, I'm willing to I'm willing to accept it, that it's not really over the top. It's like, yeah, I'd probably be freaking out, too, if I'm. Because it, it's a it's a it's a race at that point, right? Like in that scenario, that T seventy two, he's pointing at me, yeah. I'm pointing at him. The question is, whose loader is going to get done first? Yeah, and you can watch there the, first. Yeah, you can watch and no the one's going to be calm about his turret. You, yeah, I mean, yeah, sure no one's going to be calm during that. Yeah, that's super cool. The first time I noticed that, I was in the T seventy two, and I was like, yep, "What is that thing that keeps your popping your around? human loader in the Abrams is racing his AZ carousel auto loader at that moment, yeah. and it's a, it's counting down the time to see who can fire next." Yeah. And of course you're going to be yelling. I mean, yeah. So, so no, I think it's, I think it's good. It, like you said, it adds some, some dramatic flair and some flavor and, and then the music. Um, yeah. I'm going to turn the music back on because I had the music on and I turned it off because I typically don't have music playing when I play, but, uh, but, but I did notice that. So now that you brought that up, I'm going to put it back on and, and play around with it. Yeah. Um, it's pretty cool. One more thing about the sure. voices since, uh, and I'm glad you brought it up since we have basically we have a very small team. We've layered that on uh, several times here. We do crowdfunding, all that jazz. We do what we can. But uh, for, we have basically spent nothing on marketing. Any mm. notice that we've been given from people like you, from streamers or influencers or anything has just been I found this cool game. This is nice. Let's you know, uh, let me show yeah. it off a little bit. Yeah. One video, just, I don't know, maybe a month after we released the main voices kind of set for the U.S. Army, one video mm -hmm. kind of came up from a, a YouTuber who didn't have a huge, uh, you know, uh, subscriber base or anything like that. And it was just him playing the game, just listening to the commands that were given from the voices, from the commander. Uh, and he was going so lockstep with every choice that the the voices were making that the AI was making, and he was able to accurately like find each tank and see all of, and hear all the intensity from everyone's voice. That video shot up so much and got us just so much notice, and we were like, "That's that's incredible," because we yeah. saw so many people liking this intensity, liking this thrill. And, and that just brought in another wave of people into our Discord and, and got us even more information from people. I think the voice would be like this. So why did you guys decide to to call it out like this, et cetera? And just like that kind of feedback has been golden for us as we've been making this game. Yeah, voices are very popular as a, a thing that attracts people to the game. I think it's because it's the, the kind of the human element, the emotion in it. You, yeah. you play a tank game, you don't expect to be drawn in psychologically and to feel like the intensity of what's going on and then the uh, yeah. like your crew screaming at you it hits you and it's like holy shit yeah this is actually really dangerous yeah no it's you guys are right on and i know what video you're talking about because I, I came across it too and it, it was huge video count and i was like oh who's this guy and i was like oh he's a very small channel like how do you get this big thing um mm -hmm. but people are very interested in in that um now it hits it just right the intensity is definitely there um so I, yeah, no, nothing but kudos for that. Um, I just, in general, I mean, we'll wrap it up. Uh, I've taken a lot of your time. I know you guys are busy, but I did want to give you a chance to, to share. Cause, cause yeah, I, I think, you know, it, all press is good press. And like I said, there's plenty of people in my community that are interested in it and, uh, uh, have been following it. Uh, any last thoughts on, on what you want to share about the game or, or the future? Uh, Josh? yeah, I've got some so we have this 
Steam demo just went up for Next Fest June uh, 2022 edition. This is the an event that Steam puts on every once in a while for games that are upcoming. If you have an unreleased game on Steam, you're allowed to do it one time before your release. And we saw this one coming. It fit a, a time window before early access, and we said, "Yeah, let's go, let's jump on it." I think it was a good move. I think people are really enjoying it. But if someone is uh, listening to this and they have not tried the Steam demo yet and it's still up, definitely check it out if you can. It's uh, very cool. Gives you a little glimpse into what we're doing. Uh, And that also helps us a lot because the more people play that and the more people wish list on Steam, uh, Steam understands that this is something that people are interested in and it will recommend it more. We don't have a real marketing budget, like was mentioned earlier. We're doing this on just a shoestring budget. So we have to really do everything organically and straight up. We get more people interested. We use those systems as they were designed. That's all we have available. So definitely check it out. It's a really good way to support the project. And we're excited to see where it goes from there. Randomly (laughs) takes cash. Done. (laughs) <laughs> I would just the bag has to have a giant dollar sign on it and obviously be filled with cash. Uh, if you give me more money than that, I will take them back out. <laughs> Ooh, I love that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Pit, pit the community against itself. Right. Free you market. A true gamer. <laughs> Which side are you on? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, boy. Well, uh yeah i'll just wrap it up by saying that uh again i'm i'm a huge fan of what you've done i mean i think i i download the demo and i think the next day i signed up on your patreon because i was like yeah this, these guys we really appreciate are, that are thank it. you no it's uh it's my pleasure and um i appreciate you guys coming on and and sharing some of this information and uh yeah hopefully the word gets out and um we see more and more stuff i'm gonna play with this campaign a little bit and uh yeah, we'll go from there, but wish you guys the best of luck on it. Yep, we awesome. appreciate that. And thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us about it. Yeah, this has been a lot of fun. 